Thanks a lot for coming out tonight. My name is Paul Imhoff. I'm the superintendent of schools. A little bit of business right off the top here. If you are here to be trained as an umpire for baseball in Central Ohio, you're in the wrong room. If you're here to be trained as an official for, uh, uh, for lacrosse in Central Ohio, you're also in the wrong room. And if you think you're on a flight to Atlanta, you're also in the wrong room. We are here for a facilities planning meeting tonight, and I want to thank you for coming out. Obviously a busy night at the high school. Uh, we did this meeting the, uh, the, the, this morning as well. Um, we are filming the meeting tonight, and we'll put this on our website so that those who are not able to be with us can, uh, can, can uh, get the information. We'll also be placing the PowerPoint on our website. Um, we have been having meetings around facilities now for years. Um, and there are people in this room who have been to every meeting for three years. And that is great, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Many of you could come up and do what I'm doing for, uh, uh, for me, and I may ask you to do that in a minute. Um, there are other people that this is your first meeting, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Be, be, because we're in so many different places, we wanna personalize your, uh, your experience tonight. So we're not gonna be taking questions from the, uh, the, the, the entire group at once because we're in so many different places. Uh, but later on in the meeting, we are gonna break and there, and there, there will be an opportunity for uh, those of you who, who wanna dig in deeper in different areas to come up to us and ask your questions on, on, on an individual basis. And that's just a more efficient way to handle that. So people in the room who've been to meetings for three years don't have to backtrack. And those of you who this is your first meeting, you're gonna be able to get all the information about the process to get caught up in the process. Um, so as we look at tonight, who's driving? Thank you, Karen. Um, we're gonna talk about our guiding principles. We're gonna talk a little bit about finances. We're gonna talk about the role of this committee and what you're doing tonight. We're gonna to spend a lot of time tonight and you're gonna hear us talk a lot about teaching and learning. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what's gonna happen inside of these buildings. What is happening inside of these buildings is more important than the buildings. And so we wanna make sure that the buildings are designed to support what is happening in our classrooms. That is what's most important. We're gonna talk about uh, the work of a steering committee. And then most importantly, we're gonna be giving you an opportunity to give us your a, a f a feedback. Uh, many of you have signed up to be on a building team. Maybe you signed up to be on the building team for Wycliffe or the high school. Uh, for a four hour meeting tonight, we are gonna stay together most, most of the night and at the very end of the meeting, we are gonna break up into buildings. I will tell you that we're gonna be having another round of meetings and I'll tell you more, uh, more about those uh, later on in the spring. And at those meetings, you're gonna spend almost all of your time broken up by building um, and so that'll be coming and again we will be talking more about that so why are are we here and I mentioned teaching and learning and I mentioned the fact that what happens in the buildings is so much more important than the buildings themselves as we start this meeting and every meeting we always like to take a step back and remember what guides us our mission is to challenge and support every student every step of the way. This is about individual students in our classrooms each and every day. And our vision is uniquely accomplished students who are prepared to serve, lead, and succeed. These are very important to us, and our mission and vision truly drive everything we do for each and every individual student in our care. So as we are here tonight, we are gonna be spending a lot of time talking about our vision for what needs to be happening in these buildings because that needs to drive what these facilities look like. I will tell you that, and you all know this, in UA we tend to do things differently than almost anyone else. I learned that quickly when, when I came here. We spent almost three years just getting to this point. We are very thorough here, right? Um, and, our, and, 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 and our community is very engaged and very involved, and that makes us who, who we are. Um, but to that point, we're also going to design our buildings differently. 
One of the things that our Board of Education has told us, and I want to pause now and recognize two of the members of the board who are with us tonight. We have Robin Comfort right over here and Mr. Scott, uh, Mr. Scott McKenzie right here. We appreciate them coming out tonight. One of the things that the board has told us is they do not want us building brand new 1950s buildings. Think about that. Do not build brand new 1950s buildings. I will tell you that many school buildings are built across the country every year that look identical to the school buildings built in 1950, except they are new. How many of you know that the, 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 the world our kids are entering is vastly different than the world of the 1950s? And we need to make sure that our buildings are a tool for preparing kids for their future, not our past. And we're going to be talking about that tonight. And that work is really driven by our guiding principles. At the beginning of our process, a couple of years ago, we worked together with our staff, our community, and our students to define these guiding principles. And these are on your tables. And, I, and so I would ask you to take a, a look at these and make sure you understand those. Um, in all of the meetings we have been having, up to this point, and we're going to be giving you uh, an, an, an update on what's been ha happening in those meetings. We always start here. What are our guiding principles? What drives us? And this is all about what's happening inside the buildings, because what's happening inside the buildings are much, is much more important than the buildings than, than themselves. And again, we want that to drive our design process. Obviously, safety is one of our guiding principles. And as we look at designing buildings that are future ready, one of the things we know, especially from talking to people um, out, out in the private sector, is flexibility of spaces is very, very important. So I will tell you that our future ready schools are likely to, uh, to, to include a lot more glass on the inside of the buildings than our current buildings have. And there are some people, when they, when they hear glass on the, on, on the inside of a building, immediately go to safety and wonder, is that safe to have glass on the in, in, inside of a building? And so I just wanted to talk about that for a minute. First of all, safety is one of our guiding principles, and we are involving our police and fire departments in this process every step of, of the way. But one of the things you have to know, too, about schools is years ago, when school shooting started, and it's sad that we even have to talk about that, all of the law and, and, and enforcement officials taught us to go into lockdown and to stay in the buildings and to hide. And that is what we used to train our kids and staff to do. That has changed because tragically that did not work out well in a number of, of instances. And so now we actually train our kids and our staff to run to get out as quickly as possible because the people who study these things have told us that is the safest thing. And so there is a school of thought that glass can actually be helpful because you can see and you know what, what is coming possibly and you can get out. And so I do want you to know that we're likely to have more glass, but safety, of course, is the most important thing in our buildings. So. At this point, we're gonna pause from talking about what's happening inside of the buildings to talk a bit about money. And before I hand it over to our, our treasurer, Andy, and Andy Geisfeld, to talk about money, one of the things he always likes me to mention is this. Our budget for these projects is fixed. Andy, what is our budget? It's fixed. How much is it? $230 million. $230 million. That is our budget, okay? We are the public sector. There is no way for us to get any more money. You all voted yes to that, and that is it, okay? So we have to stay in budget. There is no option to go over budget, and so throughout our process, we will be doing estimates, multiple es estimates by different companies throughout our process because going over budget is not an option. Andy, is going over budget an option? It is not an option. It is not an option. And so I just want you to know, though, because of that, throughout the process of design, 
there will also be times we have to say no. Um, and I liken this to, and maybe this has never happened in your family, it's happened in mine. So we want a new kitchen. So we bring in people to look at the kitchen and we dream. And we want this and we want that and we want this. And then we get the price. Has this never happened to any other family? And then we renegotiate our dream, okay? And we decide to bring things down a bit. The same thing happens when you are going through the design process for schools. Our budget is fixed, and I do want you to know there will be things that people want we are going to have to say no to because we have to live within our budget. Now, did I cover that clearly enough for you, Andy? What's our budget? <laughs> okay, $230 million. This is Andy to talk about the money. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, several of you have probably heard in the past, as we were doing this the last two and a half years, that we really were hitting hard on our bond rating. And why is our bond rating important to us? A bond rating is like our credit rating for schools. So as we do bond ratings, we as a district have a AAA with Standard & Poor's and a AA1 with Moody's. Those are two of the highest, uh, two of the highest possible. We are among a, a handful of districts in Ohio that have those bond ratings. And why is that important then? So that at the higher the bond rating, usually the lower the interest rate, so therefore you get a better deal than when you issue the debt. Now when, you issue, when you're gonna issue debt, you have to go back to the credit rating agency and you have to ask them to go ahead and revisit your bond rating. So we went in front of the bond rating agencies uh, early in January and gave our presentation. And one of the things they said is obviously issuing more debt raises your debt ratio. So there is a, a with some ratios there that kind of concern them. So then I said, what can offset that? And what, one of the biggest things they said is because of the support of the community over the decades, that is a key to help offset that, that, that debt ratio. The second key was strong financials and strong financial practices. And after we had that discussion, what they came back to is they reaffirmed the cur current ratings we have, which is very important to us so that as we had the AAA and the AA1, when we went to market then two weeks ago to sell our bonds, it was a very challenging market. As you've seen lately, just with everything going up and down, up and down, the bond market is, is no better. And as we went out there to, to sell those, we ended up much better than several of the other entities because of our credit rating, our bond rating. So with that, I am proud to say that we came back with a strong deal for the community. You know, we said worst case would be, uh, as we did our conservative estimates, was 5%. We're a little bit under 4% as we sold them, so it's good for the community. It allows us to keep the structure that we we're hoping to do to make the best, uh, best long-term impact for the district. So good credit ratings, a strong sale, is good for us as a district, and we're glad to come home and actually have that done. We'll be receiving the money here in about another three weeks, and we'll be ready for our projects. So once again, because of the community support and because of our bond ratings, it ended up good for the, good for the district. Thanks. Great, thanks Andy. The other thing that we want to talk about as far as the finances is, is our plans to raise money privately. Um, as you know, when we uh, went, went, uh, went through our planning process, one of the things we committed to was raising at least $5 million privately to offset the cost of the project. And so we are, we are getting ready to launch that effort, and we are working with the education uh, found, uh, found foundation in that effort, and it's going to look very much like a private school camp campaign or a university campaign where we're gonna be offering naming rights for different spaces. Uh, say, uh, say a family would like to name the auditorium after a, uh, a, a loved one or something, there will be an opportunity to, to do that. And so, we've, and so we will be offering spaces um, at all different types of price points. The Board of Education will, uh, will be deciding that. And there will be opportunities for people to get involved at all types of different levels. Um, I do want you to know that even though we haven't launched it yet, and I love and, and, and I love UA, that this is a very engaged place, people have already been calling and saying, you know, I'd like to have first dibs on this or on that. Um, and so if there are people in this room who have thought about that and you would like to be a part of that, um, I would recommend calling sooner rather than later because even though we haven't launched it, people are already calling. And again, we're excited about that. So at this point, a couple of takeaways so far. Is the budget fixed? Yes. yes, okay, so we're all there. And are the buildings the most important thing or is what happens inside the buildings the most important thing? Option one or two? 
Option two, right? And so what we're gonna do now is talk a little bit more about that. And I'm really excited uh, to have uh, Keith uh, uh, Pomeroy, our Chief Academic Officer with us, and Andy Hatton, who's our Director of Academic Affairs. And they are two of the leaders of our teaching and learn, a learning team in the district. And they're gonna talk a little bit more about what is gonna be happening inside of our buildings. Mr. Pomeroy? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Keith Pomeroy, Chief Academic Officer. So we wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about teaching and learning. As Paul likes to say, uh, the board has asked for us not to build brand new 1950s buildings. That means we need to be thinking about what instruction looks like in those spaces. So what we're asking our steering committees to do and staffs as we meet with staffs is to start thinking about what does that mean as we create these new spaces? They're a tool to support the learning changes that we want to see long term. So tonight we're going to start with a short video um, that really focuses in on high school. So you're going to see that this is going to be focused mainly on high school, but this is a K-12 experience. We're going to start with a disclaimer. This is from a project called the XQ Super School Project. So it's going to feel a little bit like an infomercial in the middle, but I think you'll see why we wanted to share the video because it asks a lot of questions we need to be thinking about. This is America in 1900. This is a car in 1900. And a phone. And a high school. This is America in 1950. And a car. And a phone. And a high school. This is today. A car. A phone. A high school. Whoa. Back up. So cars are now this. And phones are now this. But high schools are still that. American high schools are based on the same model. And it's been over a hundred years. Wow, that's a long time. But why? In 1900, it made sense for high schools to prepare students for that. But in 2017, shouldn't they be preparing students for this, and this, and even this? So why are we still granting diplomas based on the time a student spends in a seat? Why are we still using the Carnegie Unit, which was developed in 1906, and says the formula for learning is four years sitting at a desk multiplied by one subject taught at a time, equals students ready for the future? All questions XQ the Super School Project asked America to help answer. There was a competition. Not that kind of competition. This kind. The kind where communities across the country come together to rethink high school. So every student, everywhere, can be prepared for the future. And that's big. Like really big. Like the largest open call in history to redesign high school big. This is the hard work that went into it. 10,000 people across the country became school builders, and thanks to them, there will be brand new ways of teaching and learning. Starting with America's first super schools. Schools that will let students learn by doing, that focus on the future and spark curiosity. Schools that build community, unleash potential, and solve real world problems. Schools that will ask their students what they think and will actually listen to them. Students, like me. So we love that video for multiple reasons. Um, we think it's really interesting when you look at the fact that Upper Arlington as a city and Upper Arlington as a school district are reaching our centennial. So we're at the point where we're reaching 100 years. And the portion of the video that we try and point out is schools were designed for what, they, what was needed at some point. That's just changing. So we need to have a cherished past and a golden future. This is our opportunity to really look at that future and build the learning experiences toward that future as well. So we think that that is critical as we prepare not only to open the space, how do we prepare our staff? and think about the learning experiences that we want in that space. As you look at the guiding principles document, we pulled all of these words out of the guiding principle document because there's quite a bit in here that we think is critical for what we're trying to accomplish in this process. We had the opportunity with the high school steering committee to have three CEOs that are Upper Arlington residents talk about space as they're transitioning. They're all either moving into new space or have just moved into new space or our designing space currently. And as we listen to them, 
there are a lot of things on this list that we heard them using in their design principles as well. So when you look at serve as a center for the community, um, they talked about safety in their environments, um, all of these things, spaces for collaboration, um, all of those flexible environments, um, all of those were things that we were hearing from them in their learning space as well as as they look at the people they're searching for. So Andy's gonna talk a little bit about what this means for our learners. Okay, so, uh, Andy Hatton, Director of Academic Affairs. So what Keith was talking about is that we also lifted out of our strategic plan these terms that have been around and that we are committed to. What kind of skills and dispositions do we want our students to have? And many of these skills and dispositions have always been important. We've talked about, you know, you might have heard of 21st century learning. Well, we've been in the 21st century for nearly two decades now. When we now know that we need to be serious about the types of skills and dispositions we want our kids to have. And many of the CEOs that we talked to in the world of business said the same exact things. They want people who persevere, who have great attitudes, who like to have fun, who work well with others, who are, uh, have really, you know, grit and determination. And so these are the guiding principles that we want for our students because as you heard Mr. Imhoff say, form follows function. What kind of learning experiences do we want to have in our schools that lead to these kind of outcomes so that students can be life ready? Because one thing we did not hear the CEO say was we need somebody who can really nail worksheets. Or we need, some, we need kids that can just crush multiple, cho multiple choice tests. Did not get mentioned once. So this is what we're looking for. Now we could have, the other thing that we're working on with our staff, and we could have bored you with a laundry list of neurological research behind the brain what, and what we're learning about the brain and learning. So we, instead we just drew this picture. Learning is not a straight linear line, and we've known this for a long time. We all learn at different paces. We learn at different times. We all learn to walk at different paces. We learn to talk at different paces. I have a nephew that it took him three or four years to even say a word, and now he's at Ohio State. He's fine. We all learn at different paces. So if we know this to be true, we know that we want to personalize learning, which is also in our strategic plan. But what does that really mean? And now is our golden opportunity, as Keith said, to bring this to life. Getting students and learners what they need, when they need it, where they need it, to personalize. We wanna make sure that we are having active learning engagements. And this is nothing new. John Dewey was screaming this over 100 years ago, learning by doing bringing the subjects together to have lessons that engage students uh, in multiple competencies. Um, we want it to be culturally responsive because we know that that is very important to our community and we want to focus on the whole child. Uh, I was in the uh, meeting earlier today that also had a great turnout. Again, thank you for being here tonight, late on a Monday night. Early this morning, people were you know, concerned about, well, I hear a lot about STEM or a lot about just computer science or a lot. We want to educate the whole child, the arts, the sciences, all of it. And we want students to have voice and choice in that. So that is the challenge that we face in teaching and learning. Now we need the spaces to enhance that. So what we'll leave you with tonight is, as we work with steering committees, and we would ask the same of you tonight, as you're looking at your activities that you're going to do to share your feedback, we all bring our frame of reference to school, to spaces that we visit. Um, in the 10 phases of innovation, they talk about the concept of Vujade. day. Rather than deja vu, Vujade day is the concept of seeing things for the first time. So thinking back to when you were a child and having that sense of wonder and having the ability to see things for the first time and think about them differently, um, they ask you to look at spaces and look at design and look at what you're considering, not with your frame of reference, but to set that down and remember that sense of wonder. We think that this quote sums it up very well. The real act of discovery lies not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Andy to come back out here because um, Andy shorted you a part of his presentation, okay? <laughs> So one of the things Andy talked about today was our vision, and a part of our vision has to do with snow days. And I want you to share that, because this morning that was very important. I'm not kidding, it was very important, and I got a lot of reactions to that this morning. So can you share that with this group as you did this morning, please? Sure. I don't Thank you. 
I don't know if it's gonna I think land. Sir, I, think, I, I don't I, know if it's gonna I, land as well right I, now. Okay. <laughs> it's gotta be in the flow, and it wasn't in the flow right now. So what I what I was saying earlier today with what we want for our learners and what we want for all students is for the on the in the unfortunate situation that Mr. Imhoff has to make the decision to close school for a calamity if we've got too much snow and ice, I want kids bummed out about that. And tweeting, no, like putting memes out there like, no, that I want them charging through the, we, not I, we want them charging through the doors and upset because they're missing something so incredible that day that, they're, that they know that they're missing out. That's the type of passion that we have for this work. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want you all to miss that. I think that's very important. You know, and, and we've talked, and I want you to know we're very serious about this. This starts with what's going to happen inside the buildings. That has to be where we start. I'm going to tell you in just a moment about uh, the structure we have put in place to get feedback for all this. And we have many, many people who've been involved in many, many meetings already. And we have spent hours and hours and hours talking about our vision for what's going to be happening inside the buildings. And I want you to know that the buildings are not going to be opening for a couple of years, but we're going to be working during that whole time to prepare all of us to, to be changing to make sure we are preparing our kids for their future and not our past. And this is a commitment we have. And as we design buildings that are going to be in place for the next 50 or 60 years, it would be malpractice not to have this conversation now and be very thoughtful about starting with what happens inside our buildings. So thank you guys for talking about that. So moving on, this is gonna to get to um, the next part of the process and why you are here tonight to give us feedback. The Board of Education's theme throughout the master planning process that went on for almost three years was Your Voice Matters. And I will tell you that our theme now is Your Voice Still Matters. Um, we are in the process of designing our schools and the Board of Education has made it clear that just like we did in the planning process for the, uh, for the issue, we have to involve as many voices from our community as possible, as many staff members as possible, and as many students as possible to make sure that the buildings all, uh, uh, ultimately are a reflection of what our community values and wants. So we have put in place uh, different, uh, different committees to do this, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But whenever we put a committee in place in our school district, we always start with what is the role of that committee? And there are normally three different possibilities. One is to inform, the other is to recommend, and the third is to decide. And we think when we're asking people to come together, we need to be really clear about what we're asking people to do. Are we asking them to inform, recommend, or decide? So this next graphic, here, I'm gonna take, can I use the laser pointer? Great. So if you look at this, this is the decide column all the way down here at the bottom. And the group that's gonna make all of the final decisions is the Board of Education. So those are the five people we have elected to represent us and the power to make all the decisions that are gonna impact our new and renovated buildings rests with them. But I will tell you that what is most important to them as they are making their decisions is the feedback that they have, have received from all of these groups of, of people. So as we look at the informed category, you are all here, here tonight because you volunteered to be on, on, on a building design team. And so you are all working and, and tonight mainly in, in, in a large group, but at our next round of meetings in April or May, you're gonna be working on specific buildings. And your work is then gonna go directly to our building steering committees. Currently, we have a building steering committee for each of our six buildings. And those are committees that are made up of members of our community, members of our staff, and in the case of the high school, students. And these are groups that have been meeting for the last two months. And Steve Turks from Perkins and Will is gonna to talk to you in just a few moments about the work they have been doing. In fact, they're gonna be meeting again next, next week. And one of the things we are gonna be sharing with them is the feedback we are going to receive from you tonight and the feedback we received this morning from the people who, who, who came to that meeting. Um, 
We have had student focus groups, and Steve is going to talk about that. The student voice is critical. Um, we are going to be having many, many staff a, a, a user groups. So we had some of those happening today. Um, we are having, uh, we have formed a district-wide green team to look at issues of, of sustainability. And if you'd like to volunteer for that, you can just let us know tonight. And the first meeting of that team is coming up in, in, in a couple of weeks. We have a facilities a task, a task force that's been in place for three years, made up of, of, of members of our community who have, who, who, who have ex expertise in, in this area. So all, all of these groups are informing. And then on the, on the recommend level here is the District o Oversight Committee, and that is a group that I lead, and that is made up of Chris Potts and Andy Geisfeld and, and, and a number of us at the district level. And we are putting all of this feed, feedback together and presenting it to the Board of Education so that they can make uh, their final decisions. So I think it's really important to understand all the different things we have put in place to make sure that your voice can be heard and impact the final decisions that are going to be made by our Board of Education. So with that, I'm going to, well, with that I'm going to talk about one more piece, then I'm going to pass it off to Steve. Um, if you came to our last meeting, you will know that we talked about the design process for school always falls into four phases. The first phase is the programming phase, and we are in that now. And the programming phase is simply working together to determine the number of spaces, the size of spaces, and, uh, and the adjacencies of spaces. So how big are the classrooms? How many are there? How big is the auditorium? How big is the gym? All of those things, and what wants to be next to, to each other. We are in that process now. Um, starting in March, we are gonna enter in to the next phase of the process, which is schematic design, often called SD. During that part of the process is when you start to see a floor plan of what the building is actually going to look like on the inside and the elevations or, or, the, or, the, or the renderings of what the building is going to look like on the outside. That work hasn't started yet because we're not going to start that work until we hear from all of you uh, t -t tonight. And we're going to go through some activities tonight so you can let us know your thoughts and feelings about what the inside of the building should, should look like and what the outside of the building should look like so that, we, so, so that when we start that work next month, it is being informed by what you have told us. So when we come back here to our next round of meetings in April or May, you're gonna see drafts of what the inside of the building is gonna look like and what the outside of the building is gonna look like. But again, those, uh, those, uh, those drafts will, uh, will have been informed by our community staff and students. And then the last two, uh, 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 two phases of the process are design development, or DD, and construction documents, or CD. And those are parts of the process where we just add more and more uh, uh, details into the process. And then we will be, 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 be ready to break ground on our uh, buildings about a year from now, except for Windermere, which is gonna follow on about a year later. So now this is Steve Turks from Perkins and Will, who's going to give you some feedback about what's been going on with all these teams I've talked to you about. Steve? Thank you, Paul. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be back with UA. Okay, so Paul just described the, uh, the design process. This is that first piece of it, that three-month programming and uh, concept design phase. And I really, really what I want to do is to kind of run you through what we've been doing in these meetings and just share a little bit of the, uh, the outcomes of those meetings. It's been taking place over a three-month period, December, January, and February. As Paul mentioned, our third meeting and final meetings are happening next week. And then we're going to launch headlong right into the design phases. So I'm going to describe what, uh, the first workshop. One of the things we asked everybody to come to the first workshop with was an aspirational word. Something that could describe you know, for them would uh, sort of help, under, help us understand as designers their big ideas, things that the building should do. Chris is, is saving me with some water. Thank you. So this is the, this is the results from the, uh, the high school. And the, the, so we pushed all these words into a, what's called a wordle. And if you don't know the way that a wordle works, uh, when you put the 
the, the, uh, the words into the software, the, the more times the word is repeated, the bigger the word ends up on the screen, okay? So inspirational was the, one of the major themes that came out of the conversation with the high school folks. Now, who was in those meetings were high school teachers, administrators, uh, community members, and students. I think we have five students. Is that right, Chris, five? It might be six in the, in a, in the, uh, the steering committee for the high school. But other words, uh, creativity, innovative, uh, engaging, uh, organic. The elementary wordle looks like this. Uh, flexibility was a huge theme on the elementary level, but also, you know, it should be a creative place, some place that's bright and comfortable, inviting, uh, some place that that spawns curiosity and, and and supports collaboration, and the importance of community. One of the activities that we did is something we call visual listening. You'll notice the, the sheets on the wall here look vaguely familiar to the ones that you see up on the glass walls over here uh, to your left. These were, though, grouped in themes. So themes like flexibility and transparency or environmental <laughs> stewardship, photographs that sort of depicted those themes. And the idea there, there is to put dots on images that for whatever reason speak to you, and then we had a conversation about those. Tonight, I'm going to explain, we're going to have you look at interior spaces and exterior spaces and do basically the same exercise. Put dots on spaces or, or photographs that either have, you have a positive reaction to or a negative reaction to. So this was from the high school. At the elementary, uh, at the very first workshop, we had all of the elementaries together. Uh, there are about 20 steering committee members for each high school or each elementary. So times five, there were 100 people in the room that day. These are the results, uh, just a couple of themes that came out of these for the high school that in terms of the top dot getters, if I can couch it that way. Outdoor, you know, it's important about outdoor learning, environmental stewardship was really came through as a strong theme and uh, uh, importance of wellness and athletics. For the uh, elementaries, uh, outdoor learning, again, was very high, highly rated. Uh, personal reflection, though, was the highest in terms of uh, the number of dots it got. As, as was flexibility and transparency. So some themes that you know, just as, as the elementary folks were thinking about the, their buildings, those things uh, rose to the, to the surface for them. There's another activity we did that we call activity mapping. And this is a, the, real, the basic idea behind this is what type of work do you, for the speak, thinking about the future, what type of work do you expect students to be doing in the buildings on a daily basis? So, yeah, there's one format, which is, is the one that we're all used to, that one we grew up, most of us grew up with, with teacher in the front room, talk, you know, lecturing, transferring knowledge to students. But there's also many, so many other activities that Andy and Keith were talking about. Students working in small groups, on their own, individually, with technology, connecting to uh, other places. And so the idea here is to understand what are those activities so that we can wrap the right kind of space around those activities. And uh, these are the, these are the, uh, the results uh, uh, from, a, from the high school level and, and at the elementary level. Uh, one of the themes that came through there was this sort of uh, direct instruction mode is important, but uh, if you look at it just as a percentage of time, it's, it's pretty low on the totem pole. So those other activities that need to be supported do need different kinds of spaces to support them. We also handed out something we call a program tree. This is for the high school, so that, that sheet of paper was as large as those poster boards on the glass wall over there. They show every single space in the building just graphically, relative size, the circle, the bigger the circle, the bigger the space. And we just asked the, uh, the, element, or the elementary and the high school steering committees to react to those. Do we have the right quantities, the right types? And uh, talk to us a little bit about the relationships between spaces. So you can see if you just look at all the dots here for the high school, there's a lot of dots of different kinds of spaces. In the second workshop, uh, we talked, we had another conversation about uh, the, the trends for t uh, future ready schools and the kind of things that support future ready schools. The high school had done, uh, in advance of us starting the, the, uh, the workshops, they had done a lot of work on their own thinking about this idea of space and they came up with a list of a half a dozen of really important design, what they call design perspectives. And so I wanna share those very quickly with you now, just sort of going around the circle here. And we created an icon for each one of those, but 
The importance of one-to-one -one student teacher interaction was one of the themes. There's another one that was time to go deep into a subject or an area of interest. Natural light and environmental, uh, environmental uh, being environmentally friendly or sustainable. Down at the bottom here, making learning visible. How do you put that learning on display? Paul mentioned perhaps more glass in the learning environment. A notion of flexible spaces and flexible furniture. Maybe the space can flex and get larger or get smaller if it needs to. And then lastly, aligning academics with real world experiences and real world skills. How do we do that? So just real quickly, some, some spaces that might begin to, to, to spawn some thinking about those. You know, smaller spaces that allow students to interact one-on-one -on -one with each other or one-on-one -on -one with uh, a, a teacher. Uh, we talked about this notion of cross-disciplinary learning and uh, without going into a lot of detail, it has to do with how we plan the building. Uh, traditionally, maybe an easy analogy is to think about a high school traditionally. Uh, the high school I went to had a hall for math and then there was a hall for science and a hall for English. Does this sound familiar? Okay, but if you want to think about doing going across content area, having them having a building subdivided that way doesn't really uh, make it very easy to do that. So, if you look here at Blythewood High School, which is near Columbia, South Carolina, this building could be organized in departments, traditional departments, social studies, math, English, and so forth. But it could also just because of the way it's planned it's very easy to go across disciplines or across content areas. It's just how you locate spaces adjacent to each other. So it's a very important notion in terms of the planning for the new high school, especially. Sustainability came through as a big theme. And you know, the building definitely wants to be environmentally friendly. As Paul mentioned, there's a green team that's been put together that's going to, that we'll be working with. There are ways we can put that on display. So here at uh, Drew Charter High School in Atlanta, there's photovoltaics on one of the roofs that the students see all the time because they use this stair. Spaces that uh, talk about and, and promote this, night, this notion of the vis making learning visible. So here students are on display working together, but they're actually writing ideas on the glass wall and it becomes very visible that way. Spaces that are flexible, that allow different uses uh, simply by opening the doors and connecting, connecting to the space that's in the foreground. But notice students also using these glass uh, pivoting doors to write on, get ideas, make learning visible. And then real world skills, those kinds of programs and spaces that allow students to work on real projects, meaningful projects. I'll talk about that one again in just a moment. One of the other exercises we did at the second <laughs> workshop is something we call the paper doll ec uh, exercise. What is that? So for the high school, these are all the spaces, uh, actually it it's, would represent one quarter or one fourth of the spaces in the core academic part of the program. So regular classrooms, uh, uh, science labs, those types of spaces. So you can imagine this as a kit of parts. We asked the, the, uh, the committee to cut these apart with scissors. That's exactly what they did. We showed a couple of tradi you know, here's a tra traditional way they could be organized down a corridor. But there's also using the same pieces and parts and square footages can get classrooms that can open to each other, can open into a large common spaces where the commons can be a space in and of itself. So it's basically taking that same corridor that was in the first option and dividing it into four pieces and they get turned sideways and make now a different kind of space with the same square footage. And arguably you can do more with that space than you can with this one. Okay, so just how you organize the same square footage to allow it to work harder for you. And that's a major theme that you're gonna see emerge here momentarily. So this is a, this is a photograph of what that exercise looks like. Cutting the pieces out, talking about them, uh, tussling back and forth over, should it be here, should it be there, pasting them down. And ultimately you get these sort of diagrams that begin to emerge that have, actually all of them have a theme of sort of wrapping these spaces around a core of any number of different things. This group said maybe it's an atrium to bring light down into the building, or maybe in fact it's an exterior courtyard that we're wrapping uh, spaces around. So you can see that kind of common theme that emerged from all of these diagrams. So as we go back into the planning phase, which is the next one, the real design phase, this will be important critical feedback for us as we begin to think about how we arrange spaces. 
we had students do the same thing. The last time we were here, the Monday night, we had about 40 middle school students, and we had about the same number of high school students on that Tuesday night. We did a couple of exercises. We did the uh, visual listening with them. We also did the paper doll activity and said, okay, from a student perspective, how would you arrange these same spaces? Interestingly enough, it wasn't that different from what the, uh, the steering committees did. You can see up, I mean, I'm not gonna show you all these, but spaces that wrap around a core of uh, uh, spaces in the center. There, that was a strong theme that emerged. So from a, a high school and elementary perspective, as we've gone, come through the last two works, work sessions, these are themes that are, have emerged from core academics, from the high school. So organizing the larger program into smaller clusters or smaller communities of learners. Uh, was an important theme. Um, and those spaces might be organized, as I mentioned, around an atrium, uh, a, 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 an outdoor courtyard, some, some type of organizing device that they can wrap themselves around. A real preference for flexible spaces, different sizes, activities, uh, strong connection for natural light and connections to the outside were important. Ideas about transparency in glass walls, taking teachers and having teacher planning areas embedded into those academic spaces was important in the high school. Uh, the integration of special education, clustering of science, and clustering it vertically so that it can plug into each floor instead of having a science floor or a science wing. Make it so that it can be interdisciplinary if, if uh, UA chooses to, to do that. Same, same issue with the library. Can we create a vertical library that is accessible to every floor of the academics? And then we had an interesting conversation as we do with most high schools about what about student lockers? If you interview the students, they'll tell you we actually don't use our lockers that much. We talk to seniors, juniors and seniors, and I have, I've never visited my locker once in three years. So it begs in the question, what kind of lockering should we provide and where? And we're, so we're having conversations about that. And again, making spaces work really hard so they don't set idle. At the elementary level, uh, creating spaces that work for kids was a really important theme. Organizing classrooms around collaboration spaces, or in the case of Greensview, had this really interesting idea about wrapping classrooms all the way around the library as an organizing device. Flexibility of classrooms uh, via garage doors to those common spaces, and this notion of creating this kind of front porch to your classroom, which is part of a common spaces, and I even went so far as to say, I'd be willing to make my classroom a little bit smaller to get that front porch, that you know, to increase that commons and collaboration space uh, for, at, at most of the schools. Uh, embedding instructional support, uh, recognizing, there was, a re was definitely a recognition that at uh, Barrington and Tremont in particular, where we're gonna be renovating academic space, the look and feel of that may be a little bit different because of some uh, limitations of those current existing buildings, but the idea is gonna try to be the same. And then again, making spaces work really hard. So we've got the final and third workshop, as I mentioned, coming up next week. And so we're gonna be bringing back all that information to the steering committees, working with them. We are in the process of trying to organize spaces based on those uh, paper doll exercise diagrams, and we'll be bringing that back and sharing it. What we wanna do now, though, is really get you up and get you engaged, and uh, the reason you're he really here tonight is to learn, but also to do. And the do part of this conversation now is something that we call visual listening. We have got uh, on your tables any number of things that we want your input on. Uh, we'd love you to take home a copy of the Guiding Principles. If you haven't filled out your names on the sheets and your, and your contact information, please do that. You'll find on most tables uh, some yellow dots, right? A packet of eight yellow dots and then a companion of four black dots. So the yellow dots are a thumbs up we like that interior space or a thumbs down for a black dot. Now, on the wall over here, these sets of, these sets of images, this is a really important point, so I need you guys to pay attention right now. So, because there's some confusion around this this morning. So, left of the column, the center column, there's five sheets. Everybody see those? To the right side of that column are the exact same five sheets, okay? So choose five sheets on the, in the, uh, the east cafeteria on the other side of the glass wall. Go through the door. There's another set of five. Uh, so just focus on one set of five and put your dots there. Does that make sense? 
We put, we put more sheets up just to give some more elbow space so everybody's not trying to crowd around five sheets, okay? So if, if a particular image speaks to you, whether it's uh, an indoor space and you happen to like the color or you like the daylight, that's great. If it's an exterior of a building and uh, you, for whatever reason it just turns you off, you can pull a black dot on it. We are also going to have, you see Keith the bow holding up, pens and post-its. If you want to leave an idea about a particular image, good or bad, stick it on a post-it, okay? Now some of the tables, we, we ran a little uh, short on dots, so some of you have got yellow dots with a black X through them. Anybody got, some of you guys had those. Those are black dots, okay? Some of you have got um, these little guys over here, which we in the trade call drafting dots. These are little pieces of masking tape that we use to tape up drawings. These, if they, don't, if they have an X through them, they're black. If they don't, they're yellow, okay? So our apologies, we just ran out of dots. And I'm gonna hand it off to Paul. He's gonna describe another activity. So we're asking you to do three things tonight. One is the visual a, a, a listening that Steve just went through. The other is this form that's being dropped off at all of your tables. We have not started the design of either the interior or the exterior of the buildings yet. We need to hear from you first. So this is an opportunity for you to share your thoughts, your hopes, or your dreams, or your fears about the inside or the outside of these buildings. And so we want you to be specific and we're gonna be tallying all of this. And all of this is going next week to the next round of building steering committees. And again, we have a building steering committee for each of the six buildings that is being designed now, made up of members of the community and members of the staff. And in the case of the high school, students. And we're gonna be sharing this feedback with them so that can inform what they are doing next week as well. Finally, we have stations set up for the six buildings we, we are designing. There was a question this morning, what about Burbank and the middle schools? Just to recap, the master plan that the board approved and then went to the ballot on November 7th said we were gonna come back and deal with the middle schools in Burbank in about a decade. And so we are not dealing with them yet. We are dealing with the elementary schools and the high school. So we will have our building principals at each of those stations. And if you want to go and give more detailed feedback or ask more detailed questions about the building of your choice, you have that chance as well. So if you want to do a deep dive into what's going on at Greensview, go over and talk to, to Jason Wolf, who's the principal there, and you're gonna have an opportunity to hear more about that and offer more feedback directly to Jason, who is the leader of that building. So we have the visual listening, we have this, and we also have the stations for each of the six buildings. So you can do all three of those things, but your feedback is incredibly important because again, what the board has told us is our charge is to make sure we are designing buildings that are a reflection of what you want and you value. And we can't do that unless you tell us. And so we need you to give us as much detailed feedback tonight as possible. Also, for some of you in the room, this is the first time you have come to a meeting. And so you probably have a lot of other questions about all kinds of details. And so we're all gonna stay here tonight as long as you want to stay and feel free to come up to us and ask any and all questions you have about the process and how we got to this point or our plans for moving forward. And again, we would love to, 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 to take our time and answer as many of those as possible. You're gonna be hearing after tonight about our next round of meetings, which is gonna happen in April or May, and you will get a postcard in the mail, it'll be in the newspaper, it'll be on social media, and that's gonna be a round of meetings people are really gonna to wanna to be at, because guess what happens there? That's when we're actually gonna be showing drafts of each of the buildings and what the inside and the outside may be looking like. And it's gonna be real important that we get you out there because guess what, as this stuff happens, the train starts moving down the tracks and if you wait a few months uh, or don't or, 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 or choose not to come to a meeting, there is not gonna be a way for your voice to be heard. So we need you to keep coming back so we can hear your voice and do what you would like us to do. So with that, again, I'm gonna say thank you for, for coming and I'm gonna tell you to, uh, to, to, to get to work on all the feedback. And again, we will stay here for all your questions. Thanks a lot.